What is not a bullet you dodged, but a huge tactical nuke you dodged? Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. My wife and I were prepared to buy a nice riverfront property in 2019, but the owners, her dad and uncle, were dragging their feet. We had our down payment, we were approved for the mortgage, and we had even been living there paying rent. Then the river rose 30 feet or 10 meters, and we had to evacuate. The water kept rising. The house was destroyed before we bought it, so we didn't buy it. 24 years old, had a pesky sore in my tongue that was really bothering me. My boyfriend's dad was a dentist, so when I was over at his house one night, I asked him to take a look. He recommended I go see an oral surgeon the next day for him to check it out. The next day, I decided it was feeling better, so I tried to cancel my appointment, but my boyfriend's dad insisted I go. I went, and the oral surgeon pretty much diagnosed it as cancer on the spot. It was aggressive, and by the time of my surgery to remove it, had already spread to multiple lymph nodes. They ended up removing over half of my tongue, followed by chemo and radiation. Given how aggressive it was, I often think that if I had put off the doctor's visit any longer, I probably wouldn't have survived. I'm coming up on my 10 year anniversary in January. Congrats. Walking to work in the winter, halfway through a step forward under a sky bridge when an icicle taller than me, six feet and probably two feet around the base crashes down right in front of my nose. If my bus had been a half a second earlier, if I had walked even a tiny bit faster pace, I would have been impaled from the brains to balls. I was frozen in place for a minute, quietly surveying my near death. There was another pedestrian nearby who witnessed it, and the wide-eyed, ashen look on his face as he stared at me confirmed just how narrowly fortunate I was that day. My father-in-law was working on construction of a power plant and was scheduled to work Sunday, was a union pipe fitter. Saturday, he got a call from another company asking him to run a job much closer to his house, think five minutes commute versus 50, so he accepted and didn't go to the power plant job Sunday. That day, there was an explosion at the plant, and people in the crew he was working with wound up getting killed. I had some chest pains one night and woke up my wife to tell her. She got a little scared that it might be a heart attack and we agreed that I should go to the ER. The nurses were pretty sure it was a false alarm but would run an EKG as is common practice. In my head, I was hoping that the chest pain would come back not to prove a heart attack, but so that we can find out what the chest pain was. The EKG was done by one veteran nurse and a new nurse. I was watching over their shoulders. Something was flashing on the screen that made both the nurses look at each other with disbelief. They ran it again, and one nurse went out to the station for help. The other stayed with me and very nicely told my wife and daughter to go back out to the waiting room. A few seconds later, five to six more people came into the room slowly and calmly and began prepping me for something. It turns out that I was having my second heart attack that night in the ER. The doctors and nurses found an obstruction in my heart and were prepping me to have it cleared and a stent placed. When I got out of surgery, the doctor who placed the stent told me, you probably picked the best time and place to have a heart attack right here in the ER. This happened before cell phones existed. I had a long commute home and on rare occasion, my husband drove into the city to meet me. I started for home about 15 minutes before he did on the stretch of Highway 101 that I needed to be on for about 20 miles. There was a big rig in front of me that seemed to be driving erratically. I got this weird feeling and just moved over to the next lane and accelerated past him. In my rearview mirror, I saw the big rig run over the car in front of him, flip to its side, crushing the cars in the next lane where I had just been. My husband was behind the accident, and as the police were letting cars file past in single file, he saw one of the crushed cars had a red bumper. He got home a couple hours after me and said he'd never been so happy to see my red car in the driveway, that he'd been holding his breath as he turned down our street because he really expected me to be under the big rig. Was chatting with a woman at the bar, nothing flirtatious, just casual banter. I told her I needed to head out and she asked if I could give her a ride. I was headed that way, so it wasn't a big deal. We pull into her driveway and I can see a guy at a computer in the living room through the window. I ask who it is and she replied, that's my husband, he's a pansy, I'll bring him outside and you scare him off, then we can have the house all to ourselves for the night. Every alarm bell in my head was ringing and all I could think was, how do I get this crazy out of my truck without a big scene? So I said, sounds good. As soon as she was halfway to the door, I put it in gear and burned rubber. A few years ago, I was in a small fender bender. Someone merged into my lane with me in it and smashed my driver's side door and their passenger door together. 
I had pulled my arm in from having it hanging out the window about 15 seconds before that happened, would have most likely had my arm ripped off. Almost wound up in the I-35 West Bridge collapse in Minneapolis years ago. My uncle, cousin, and I were on our way to a Twins game. We were originally planning to take the route that crossed the bridge, but last minute decided to take a more scenic route. After it happened, we were talking and we figured it probably would have been within a couple of minutes of the time the bridge collapsed that we would have been on the bridge. I was driving home from visiting my brother in Vermont when a snowstorm started. I didn't have much experience driving in serious snow and I completely lost control. Car careened off the road and I was heading for a giant boulder at around 50 or 60 miles per hour. I felt time slowed down and I reflected on my life for a moment and then said goodbye to my body. Suddenly, I was jolted out of it by an abrupt impact, but I could see that the boulder was still 20 or 30 feet away. When I got out of my car, I saw that I'd hit a little skinny tree that I could have easily grabbed with one hand. However, it had a giant root system that lifted the car off the ground and stopped me. Car was totaled, but I was completely fine because of that little tree. There's no way I would have survived the other impact. I used to work for a drainage company, drove five-ton trucks with roll-off bins used to move machines or material with them. One day I was super tired. I pulled up to a job, tilted the bed up, got out, opened the dump gates, got back in the cab, rolled forward slowly. Nice dump. Great. Get out of the cab. Go back and close dump chutes. Oh crap. Still a bunch of sand in there. Dumbass me unlatches the gate of the roll-off bin. About half a yard of sand still in there and the bin was still on an angle. That door opened so fast, the latch got catapulted into my cheek so hard it broke my orbital and knocked me to the ground, blacked out briefly. The gate itself swung out, somehow missed me, and just had clearance over my steel toe boot. Dented the steel, scraped all the fabric off the boot. I ended up with just a small scar under my right eye, but could have easily lost my toes and an eye if I'd been standing about one inch to the left. Do not operate heavy equipment while tired drunk or under the influence of drugs. Er. I quit a job after my boss yelled at everybody for faking being sick when one guy came in with the flu and passed it around the office. He claimed that people don't get sick by being near each other. One guy got it so bad he was hospitalized for two weeks. I quit with no backup in October 2019. By February 2020, his company went out of business. Yesterday, I was helping my fiancé's dad cut some tree limbs from his yard. He was on a lift trying to cut some limbs that were dangling dangerously high over a steel propane tank. The tank itself had $1,500 worth of propane. Had. He cut off a limb and it hit the tank with the largest bang I've ever heard. Propane came pouring out of the top like smoke from a mortar. He struggled to get the lift down enough to jump out and run for his life. We would later find out that the limb hit the gas valve and it fell straight down into the tank. If it had sparked once, it would have mattered how far we ran. We would have been dead. Him, me, and my fiancé, who was showering inside, unaware. Now he has no gas, is out $1,500, and almost died. Big twist is that I saw him smoking up there. There's no way we should be alive, let alone could. The gas is still leaking out even after 24 hours. I was moving abroad to do a post-grad degree. My flight was to leave out of Newark early morning on 9-11. A family friend who worked in the towers kept prodding me to move my flight to the afternoon and come visit him in the office so he could show me around. My parents were pressuring me to go as well since it was a good networking opportunity. I was on the fence, but decided not to since I was a poor student and didn't want to pay the cab fare from my hotel in New Jersey to Lower Manhattan. Our friend made it out, thankfully, and... I'm guessing I would have as well, but no way would I want that experience burned into my memory. I interviewed at a company in New Hampshire that made jams, baking mixes, lollipops, etc. for a technical job. The president, the owner's daughter, spent most of the interview dumping on their current consultant and making fun of, of all things, his degrees. That initially turned me off. Then, speaking with the owner, he makes it a point to take a call and tell the person on the other end, I'll pay you when I pay you cash flow issues? His question about my education was, what can your fancy degrees do for me? Then, when I met the VP of marketing, she asks me how many recalls I've done. Uh, none. That's not what I do. Wait, what interview is this? I decline their offer. Fast forward maybe five years. I'm talking to a guy about doing some consulting work for him, and we get on the subject of this company. 
he had interviewed there as well. He also got the vibe and declined. Turns out, they were planning on selling the company and were beefing it up for appearances. It also turns out, after the sale, that they had spent the previous months sending current clients to their next endeavor. They almost went to jail for their financial and business shenanigans. Would not have been happy to get caught in that mess. We were in Italy on a school field trip. We decided to play Schweinhofen pig pile dog pile. Anyways, one person is declared the pig and everyone has to jump on them. We played this on a beach at night. Just sand, no danger, right? Well, the last round, we got up and realized we formed this pile next to a one meter metal pole sticking out of the ground. It was maybe 10 centimeters away and could have easily impaled the first three to four people. We didn't play that game again. We went to Thailand in 2003 for Christmas. I spent a number of years there in the early 90s as a kid and loved it so much that we were going to do it again the next year. Spend Christmas watching the sun come up at a beach and fuck it again. We had the tickets and everything, but because of some new fallout from an Enron adjacent scandal, my dad wasn't allowed to leave the country. He wasn't implicated, but was in the C-suite of a credit card company, and all such people were under travel advisory. Anyway, the very hotel we were going to stay at got 100% wrecked by the tsunami, so I guess we got lucky. Back in 2004, when I was only 20 years old, I was on a road trip with my friend and her dog from California to Washington. I was on I-5 North at around 1 a.m. using my cruise control to keep my speed at 75 miles per hour. Speed limit is 70 miles per hour. I'd gotten speeding tickets in that part of Northern California before. I was familiar with this drive because my boyfriend was in LA and I lived in Seattle. So I made that trip a few times a year for a few years. All that is to say, I had learned my lesson and used cruise control to keep myself from speeding, never going more than five over the posted speed limit. So it's pitch black, early morning. My friend has her seat reclined all the way, taking a nap on the passenger side, her dog on her chest. I see what I assume to be lights from a cruiser come up behind me. The car slowly pulls alongside me and matches my speed exactly. I kept my eyes straight ahead, but I knew this person was staring at me. I wasn't panicking though, not like I had in the past when I'd encountered a cop on I-5 because I knew I wasn't really speeding. I kept glancing at the speedometer to assure myself I was good. I may have even slowed down a notch or two to be certain. After what felt like an eternity of this cruiser just keeping pace with me, he finally slows down, swerves in behind me, and puts his lights on. As I'm slowing down and pulling off to the shoulder, I nudge my friend awake and tell her I'm getting pulled over. She asks if I was speeding, she knew my history, and I assured her I was not and had been using cruise control. I was really starting to shake by this point. Cops make most people nervous, but something just didn't feel right about this stop. I knew there was no reason to pull me over. Pitch black, middle of nowhere, hadn't seen a gas station or rest area for miles. The guy strolls up to the passenger side of my car as my friend is using the lever to get her seat upright again. When he finally gets to the passenger side window, he looks visibly surprised that I have a passenger. He begins to fumble over his words, claims that I was going 90 miles per hour. He was so damn flustered, he forgot to ask for my license. I actually asked him if he needed it. He trots back to his car, and my friend and I look at each other like, WTF? Her dog, by the way, was going absolutely apeshit during this entire interaction. I never saw the dog act like that before or after this happened. Now, reminder, I'd gotten a few tickets on that same stretch of road within that same year or two. I was very familiar with this process and knew how long it should take and what to expect. In my previous experience, most cops go back to their cruisers for a good six to eight minutes. This guy came back after two minutes, kind of tossed my license and registration into my friend's lap like he was annoyed and yelled at me to slow down and told me he'd just give me a verbal warning for now. I thanked him, despite how creepy it was, and while I was putting my license back in my wallet and registration back in my glove compartment, he fired up his cruiser and floored it back onto the highway. This is also not normal. Anytime I'd been pulled over, they would always tell me to pull out ahead of them so they could make sure I merged carefully back onto the freeway. My friend and I were freaked. She was more freaked than me. I think I was trying to explain it away, give him the benefit of the doubt at first. But the longer I thought about it, the more uncomfortable I became. I couldn't shake that nasty feeling that something wasn't quite right. Fast forward many years later, I remember hearing about some cop that had been arrested. He'd been trolling I-5 North in Northern California. 
During that same time period, I'd been on road trips, stopping unsuspecting young single female motorists and sexually assaulting them in his cruiser. His MO was to pull up alongside their cars, scan them to make sure they were single females, and pull them over in desolate areas at early morning hours. He ended up murdering one of these girls when she put up too much of a fight. I can't remember his name, and I don't know what he looked like. It was too dark to see his face well, but my blood turned cold when I'd heard that definitely dodged a huge, nuclear, life-changing, possibly life-ending event thanks to my tired friend and her protective little dog. 